that noise you hear is me clapping and that clapping is for you for being here in this virtual world to join me for this presentation. I want to start by thanking the conference organizers that have undoubtedly had a complex time and also the International Society of Electrochemistry for pivoting the conference and doing so so quickly uh, to a COVID safe platform. Unfortunately, we're not in the sunshine of Belgrade, but we are joined together by spirit. And I want to make special mention of the colleagues out there at the moment and communities doing it tough from Italy, Spain, the USA, but I know you've all got this. I'm presently in Melbourne in lockdown like many others. And one tradition I like to follow is that of acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I work and live. And that is the Wurundjeri people of which a collection of their traditional symbols is seen here on this slide. Also, a thanks to colleagues uh, that have contributed to some of the science in this talk, and I will thank them and many more along uh, the way. So, corrosion of emerging materials, a great topic. However, everything I know about giving a good presentation, audience engagement and so forth, doesn't work when your audience is sitting at home, likely with others screaming in the background, uh, and I'm here in a tracksuit, also with others screaming in the background. So instead, I'm going to give this presentation as a bit of a story, and I'll unapologetically be high level to stimulate some questions, uh, many of which will hopefully be to yourselves and thoughts, as opposed to giving you dozens of equations, which you can do nothing with at the moment. But I do promise to cover some science, um, but I also feel compelled to provide a narrative. Because while the ISC covers many topics, plenaries and corrosion are not always present, and I appreciate that corrosion is a topic that lives beneath one of the ISC divisions, namely electrochemical material science. So when talking about emerging materials, I'm largely talking about what are termed engineering materials, uh, often also called structural materials, and I'll qualify what they are in a couple of slides. So some emerging materials include additively manufactured alloys, uh, um, materials designed by machine learning and AI, novel composites, high entropy alloys, but also uh, includes materials that have been made from recycled feedstock or newer versions of materials that are under development to replace incumbent materials. Um, but there are also many new functional materials emerging, as, ma as well as materials uh, that are being used in new environments. So given that corrosion is the intersection between material and environment, we are often using new material environments previously unconsidered. Example range, examples in here range from materials in mobile phones that are now exposed to sweat, makeup, and a range of other stuff, uh, to also thinking about the example we see here, which is the Audi plus Airbus concept called pop-up. Um, this seems a bit more realistic than a Jetsons cartoon, but signals that for envisaged applications, commodity materials to fulfill such roles don't presently exist. So with the exception of timber, which is nature's structural material, I give you here examples of structural materials to reinforce their relevance to our way of life. So one thing that is relevant to all materials that's surprisingly and often overlooked by occupants of the planet is that indeed materials come from here. This is our supply cupboard for everything. It's our precious earth. If we zoom in, we have forests, oceans, and geological sites that allow us to extract the metals from minerals to unlock a range of metals that we see in here, the periodic table, which is predominantly made up of metals, none of which naturally occur in the metallic state in any appreciable abundance, um, which allows us modern humans to almost now play God. So another way about thinking about the genesis of structural materials is this way. Um, and this is how I was planning on getting to Belgrade, by the way, using an aeroplane. We have a team of humans in the middle here that converts our planet to inorganic anthropogenic stuff. Uh, the process for this, actually, this anthropogenic uh, production is summed up quite exquisitely in a video called From Ore to More, uh, which has been made by Rio Tinto as a promotional video for copper production. But I think it serves a dual purpose of also showing us the major energy cost and environmental uh, cost 
accompanying metal production. So look, here's my first equation, free energy. There is a driving force to turn back to the ore and the non-metallic uh, state. This raises the question, how can we be more sustainable and how can we have materials that are more durable? And who are the stakeholders and why? Well, ideally, it's these people, the Earth's people, as they are the stakeholders and custodians of the planet from which metals come. So where I'm going with this, and where I hopefully end up in about 20 minutes, is to get you to understand that corrosion, which costs the world over a trillion dollars, um, is a human-made, or per year, is a human-made problem, and therefore must have a human-made solution. So now I'm going to talk about corrosion of some of these emerging materials, highlighting, highlighting some new info that uh, slants towards the understanding that corrosion is indeed deterministic. So let's start with additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing. Here is a section version of a 3D printed rocket. What's interesting about this, well, other than the detail that you can see that can only be uh, generated by 3D printing, what's interesting about this is that this was made by a student, not NASA. This is a sign of the world that we now live in and that change is now uh, rapid. Um, for those that have not seen metal 3D printing, this is what selective laser melting looks like, which is a powder bed uh, laser-based method for 3D printing components in uh, net shape. Um, from the work of Guy Sander, when studying 3D printed austenitic uh, stainless steel 316L, it was determined that the printed alloy was nearly twice as strong and still ductile compared to conventional wrought 316L stainless steel. This finding was really exciting, and of course the question is why. This was also reproduced by many different print, uh, metal printing machines, different powder suppliers, and also different specimen orientations, as you can see here. Well, it's not very mysterious, actually, in that the grain size of 3D printed alloys is usually very fine. So a smaller grain size, as per the Hall-Petch relationship, means a higher strength. However, the smaller grain size arises because of the very rapid solidification rate in metal 3D printing from laser-based methods. So the cooling rate is typically on the order of a few thousand degrees per second, such that rapid heating uh, under the laser to about 3000 Celsius and then very rapid cooling happens almost with instantaneous effect. Now from a corrosion point of view, what does that mean? This is another sort of high five bonus moment. Um, when polarization testing was carried out for 3D printed stainless steel, the so-called window of passivity was vast. Even with different printing conditions and even uh, imperfect conditions that led to uh, printed porosity, the passive window was significantly larger um, compared to three, uh, wrought 316 stainless steel, also accompanied by a higher pitting potential. Now, I apologize for jumping right into polarization curves, particularly presented in the non-European format, but for metals with corrosion rates that are not very rapid, fortunately, uh, the best way to measure corrosion is using electrochemistry. And of course, after all, this is an electrochemistry conference. So why would we have such a high corrosion resistance for 3D printed stainless steel? Now, a lot of detailed characterization uh, by a student called Victor Cruz and separately in collaboration with Deakin University has shown that the high local temperature in 3D printing completely annihilates manganese sulfide inclusions in stainless steel that are the known sites of localized corrosion. So here uh, on the bottom of this uh, series of, of micrographs, line profiles and maps, you can see the wrought 316 stainless steel that includes a co-segregation of manganese and, and sulfur in terms of manganese sulfides. If you look at the top, um, you can see that sulfur is not associated with manganese, but largely associated with oxygen. So the 3D printing process annihilates the manganese sulfides. And of course, um, the rapid solidification uh, thereafter means that manganese sulfide is unable to reform upon such rapid cooling. Alas, some very cool opportunities then from 3D printing. And of course, this is not the full story for 3D printed stainless steel. 
um, as issues of repassivation and sorts are presently also hot topics. But it gives you a bit of a window in terms of processing and relationships uh, with um, emerging materials. So another example of 3D printed alloys is that from Dr. Umaya Mugabe, that's now at the Sorbonne University. Um, a full presentation actually on, on that particular work in particular can also be found on YouTube and there's Umaima and that excellent YouTube video uh, link in the corner here. So the alloy, uh, aluminium alloy 2024 um, is widely studied. It's an aluminium copper magnesium alloy. It's particularly studied across Europe in the context of coatings also in terms of um, its major usage, um, with this alloy being known as uh, the common alloy used for the fuselage of most commercial aircraft. So here what you see is the microstructure of this alloy when it's uh, 3D printed using selective laser melting. The images go from a moderate magnification in the top left, and as you go around um, clockwise, uh, the magnification um, increases Actually, it's, a, it's, it, it's uh, top left to right and then bottom uh, left to right increasing magnification. Um, all of them have a similar region. Um, those that have worked on this alloy before will be thinking, what am I looking at here? Um, normally 2024 um, in the T3 temper, so the wrought version of this alloy looks like what you see on the screen now. It has large constituent particles that love to cause localized corrosion. These constituent particles are usually about 10 microns in size. Um, they can be a bit larger, they can be a bit smaller too, but they typically form um, to cluster to form networks that can be tens of microns in size, um, also leading to localized corrosion that are precursors to fatigue crack sites as well. But what you see here is that rapid solidification means there is no sign of any particles anywhere near that sort of size range of, of many microns plus in 3D printed 2024. So the nanostructure is also quite unique with precipitates being present in a spherical shape and even uh, more remarkable, unlike 2024 T3, uh, T3, the wrought version, the precipitate phase here is not uh, actually S phase. S phase is an aluminium copper magnesium precipitate which is known to de-alloy. But what you see here is a doped version of theta phase which is essentially an aluminium copper uh, particle um, which you can pick up from the images here. So what you see here is a bright field TEM image and a dark field scanning uh, transmission electron micrographic image along with the corresponding energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy maps for the regions of interest. All elements are labeled so you can pause this and see uh, your own analysis in a little bit more detail. So this nanostructure is actually quite different to the nanostructure of wrought 2024, whereby S phase precipitates notionally form heterogeneously on dislocations, as you can see here. So here's a TEM micrograph that I believe I took myself back in what feels like it was 1970, but I don't think it was that long ago. So what we see in the 3D printed alloy is actually not precipitates that form by nucleation and growth, but a unique solidification microstructure. Upon cooling from, from the molten state, uh, even for the bulk composition of 2024, the first thing to form upon cooling from the melt is actually the AL2CU theta phase, um, seen as the phase um, labeled as three in green on this uh, cooling curve that's been calculated using thermocalc. And from the region of about 540 to 510 Celsius as you cool, once this phase forms, it's actually frozen in and the microstructure from rapid solidification is set. So um, interestingly, uh, from a corrosion point of view um, and back on point for the talk, is this going to live, give you a different response? Uh, absolutely. So here I'm gonna show you corrosion measured in a different way. Uh, this is corrosion measured using an online ICP method, um, inductively coupled plasma method, which was pioneered by Kevin Ogle, um, who is based at what's now called Shimi Paris Tech. And this method uses a flow cell to monitor in real time the iron loss. So in other words, ionization or metallic dissolution from an alloy in an electrolyte. So in fact, 
other than mass loss, which is really untenable for a lot of engineering materials because they don't corrode at the speed at which you could see them uh, or see that happening in a, in a very short amount of time, this is actually the only method for corrosion analysis that can give a definitive corrosion rate at the open circuit potential. And what we see here is that during alloy corrosion in RORT 2024, AA 2024 uh, T3 um, on the left, um, aluminium is the principal element participating in dissolution over that period of time studied, um, and then magnesium at a total corrosion rate um, of up to about two nanograms per centimeter squared after about um, 10 minutes of uh, exposure to sodium chloride solution. Conversely, on the right, the dissolution rate of uh, additively manufactured or 3D printed 2024 is about 0.4 nanograms per centimeter squared after 10 minutes with a vastly decreased extent of relative aluminium dissolution. So again, there's a lot of fun to be had here and showing that corrosion is deterministic based on microstructure once more and indeed you know, now in 20, uh, 2020, as expected, um, corrosion is known to be deterministic based on microstructure, but it, it wasn't always necessarily the case. Now, you're probably thinking these have different, uh, uh, these are made differently. One's a cooling microstructure, one's a raw uh, aged microstructure, naturally aged in the case of 2024 T3. So why would we want to 3D print these sorts of alloys? And of course, the reason why is because uh, when you're 3D printing uh, aluminium alloys, you are able to unlock net shapes that are just not possible um, by any other means. So this is an example of a lattice uh, or a truss structure uh, that's been made by a PhD student, uh, Abby Babu, that shows the intricacies here. And you're able to obtain the high strengths um, in net shape um, and the ability of being able to make these complex components um, is very, very uh, wonderful um, if you think back to the uh, the application of flying cars that I previously spoke about. And that's one of my uh, hobby topics, of course, for those that know me. Another emerging material I mentioned was novel composites uh, early on in the piece. Here, uh, Guy Sandra is back at it again using 316L stainless steel, but this time for additive manufacturing, it's been blended with glass waste. So literally trash glass in powdered form. So here the image uh, shows you the feedstock material and shows you on the right a 10 weight percent glass composite powder blend with 316L stainless steel that can be seen as spheres in that image um, before 3D printing. So given that glass has a much lower density than steel, you can see that the volume of glass in that image is quite large. Um, and this makes, makes for a much, much lighter stainless steel composite. So did this work? Yes, absolutely it did. And in fact, it worked with 25 weight percent glass too. Um, but here I'll just give you one example as I'm going through an overview. Um, so on the left, you'll see an optical micrograph and the accompanying scanning electron micrograph and EDX maps to the right. Um, what look to be pores are actually not pores, it's the silicon rich phase. So what is interesting here is what, uh, what we saw in the powdered form to be a lot of glass relative to metal is actually no longer. So, so what has happened here? Well, it turns out that glass at the temperatures of selective laser melting can alloy with stainless steel and that a new phase is formed. That is a silicon, iron, chrome, manganese, oxygen phase. So again, more fun to be had here. Um, we're taking two commodity materials, blending them, and seeing for the first time um, new phases. Interestingly, this time we're using garbage as the input material, which is, which is pretty cool. I should note that in the past few years alone, um, the group has discovered several new phases all previously unidentified whilst toying around with known materials in different ways. So this is just one example um, that, that indicates quite starkly that um, we don't really know all there is to know when we're thinking about um, emerging materials. Oh, and uh, before I forget, of course, this novel composite has a low inherent corrosion rate too. Um, and if this is of interest to you folks, keep an eye out for the paper from Guy Sander coming out soon. All right, but 
for the last remaining time that I have with you, and for the core of the scientific aspects uh, that I wanted to share today, I will talk about high entropy alloys that may or may not be a new concept for many of you. So about 20 years ago, a researcher in Taiwan called Ye suggested that by taking five metals, any metals, you pick them, could be absolutely any, and mixing them, you would get a high entropy of mixing and likely form a single phase solid solution. So this notion is pretty out there as usually alloys have a single principal element and items are added to that single principal element, which is a bit like sort of making chicken soup. Um, rather than having several equal uh, equiatomic proportions of elements in an alloy. So this approach has uh, since become very interesting, perhaps even a little popular in the last couple of years, and others have deviated from the original recipes put forth by Ye, by uh, adding often less than five elements, saying four, or not worrying so much about the high, whether or not a high entropy is, is achieved. Um, such alloys are typically called compositionally complex alloys. Um, but finally, even more recently, there are alloys that have several principal alloying elements, but uh, not in an equiatomic proportion and are more generally known as multi-principal element alloys. So notation-wise, you're all up to speed. Uh, here's the notations. A nice twist is that some people use the CCA acronym uh, to mean the same thing with different words where they usually use complex concentrated alloy, um, showing that human ingenuity really has no bounds even when it comes to naming. So what is interesting about these alloys is that they have extremely unique properties. Um, they have uh, extremely, and I mean extremely, high hardness and high strength. This is very uh, attractive for demanding applications, uh, and I don't know why, but I can't uh, help but um, keep thinking about how often I drop my phone and how extremely high hardness and strength would be very useful. Uh, they're also very thermally stable and concomitantly have high melting points based on the structures that you can see here depicted in the one uh, cartoon. So personally, I became interested in these alloys about 10 years ago on account of their thermal stability, which I read into as potential for oxidation uh, resistance and the prospect of having properties that could achieve what titanium uh, had not yet done to date, and that was to be used in the hotter part of jet engines and dramatically decrease engine weight. So the ability to make such alloys in net shape using printing was also enticing. So, uh, so we started making them by a number of different methods, um, spark plasma sintering, arc melting, um, and even blown, uh, blown powder uh, methods of direct energy deposition versions of 3D printing, which you can see uh, in the top right image here. So in the misadventures of cooking these alloys up, um, rather than producing single phase high entropy alloys, even when using equiatomic uh, compositions, uh, it turns out that a lot of the alloys came out multi-phase, and that's okay. You can see an example here in the middle for an alloy <coughs> which has a composition of equiatomic um, mixture of aluminium, cobalt, chromium, copper, and iron that was made by uh, spark plasma sintering. But like any corrosion person would do, we corrosion tested them anyway, and also many other high entropy alloys, single phase or otherwise, that we could get our hands on. So such work has been reviewed uh, in the outputs of uh, Dr. Yao Chu, um, who's pictured here on his favorite tool, which is the transmission electron microscope. So what did we see when we started corrosion testing some of these high entropy alloys or compositionally complex alloys? Well, it was not what we expected. So here's some examples here. Um, this is one example for a CCA that was produced by arc melting. Uh, this particular CCA is a titanium, cobalt, chromium, iron, nickel alloy. And I'll just spend one moment talking a little bit about the notations for how these alloys are presented because it's different to how it's done for intermetallics, which gives you a stoichiometric like um, representation. And it's also different to conventional alloy composition 
um, presentations that give you a, a, an alloy composition, say in, in weight percent of the different elements here. So what we see here is the numbers are usually a fraction, um, and in this particular case, 0.7 represents 70 atomic percent of the alloy, and the fact that the elements corresponding to that 0.7, cobalt, chrome, iron, and nickel, are there uh, in equiatomic proportions means that 70% of this alloy is made up of equal proportions of those four elements, and the remaining 30% of this alloy is titanium. All right, so what did we see? We saw a huge window of passivity, as you can see in the top left, a range of passivity of over one volt, which puts stainless steel to shame. However, what was the most startling thing we realized was that the passivity was uh, present in spite of a rather heterogeneous microstructure. So this is completely against, you know, the, the sort of textbook understanding where microstructural heterogeneity is typically deemed the enemy and root cause of localized corrosion. So could this be a lie? Could we not, is something gone wrong here? Well, it turns out we saw it again for an even weirder microstructure um, that apparently looks like it's incorporating a fleur-de-lis type shape. Uh, this is an alloy based on titanium, aluminium, vanadium, iron, and nickel. Again, in uh, 0.6 molar sodium chloride, which is quite an aggressive solution. We see a big window of passivity. And then we see it again, and again, and again. And we also see it for different production methods, and even for 3D printed CCAs, which is pretty great. So then, so many questions um, with no answers, and a lot of enthusiasm to harness this sort of newly found uh, outcome um, that's not understood so much and the not understood corrosion resistance inherent to this new class of, of complex alloys. So what did we then decide to do? Well, for Yao's PhD, we realized that if we could um, make very corrosion resistant CCAs um, just by virtue of them being uh, CCAs, that we could push this finding um, for example, at the time, all high entropy alloys had a density greater than steel, and that meant that they were quite heavy. And we thought, well, look, let's try and make a light one and try and make it single phase. And uh, maybe we can extend the limits of current uh, engineering alloys. So off we went, and, and mainly because we're thinking of future applications again, and me wanting that flying car. So to achieve this, um, we look at the periodic table, which is our toolkit. Um, we can't use gases, and we don't really want to use things that are toxic. So, hello, arsenic, and your good friends, I'm talking to you. Um, and we don't want to use the elements that are known to perhaps uh, explode the lab. Um, and that includes elements in the first couple of columns on the table that are a no-no. Uh, and adding to those the equally explosive or reactive or radioactive lanthanides and actinides. Um, without using those, we were left with what's um, largely identified as the light green stuff on this table. And honing in on those with a lower density than iron, that meant that we found a pretty finite number of candidates. So we used those candidates in the empirical um, recipes and calculations to crunch crunch and determine entropy of mixing, density, and the high entropy forming rules that were set out by Yeah. And we honed in on a four component high entropy alloy that was a single phase alloy with a density, a calculated density of about 4.9 grams per cubic centimeter, which is aluminium, titanium, vanadium, and chromium. So we made it, and indeed it was single phase. Um, it has from X-ray diffraction data a single phase seen in the top left, and it also has a high chemical homo homogeneity across um, the four equiatomically added elements, which are aluminium, titanium, chromium, and vanadium. Uh, this is also confirmed structure-wise by TEM and scanning TEM mapping, so all good. But interestingly, the alloy presented some unique characteristics uh, in its structure that whilst it appeared to be a single-phase body-centered cubic, it had the characteristics of what is known as a B2 variant. So what does this mean? And I'm, I'm glad you asked. So after throwing about $20 million worth of equipment at the problem, uh, we could work out through uh, some of the most epic collaborators that I've ever worked with at Deakin and the University of Sydney via 3D atom probe tomography um, that again shows um, uniform composition, but through short range order analysis via algorithms that um, Anna Segera developed at Sydney um, on the data that Ross Marceau collected at Deakin, 
uh, we can see that the VCC structure we have has a preferred position of aluminium in the body of the unit cell and the corners preferentially occupied by titanium, vanadium or chromium. So it's this preferential location within the unit cell that um, defines a B2 structure relative to, uh, to a VCC structure. So from a corrosion perspective, we see here that this alloy is a winner. Um, and I mean a real winner. It has vastly improved corrosion resistance relative to uh, austenitic stainless steel, um, 304 in this case, um, plotted uh, on the left, um, along with pure aluminium. Um, it has a window of passivity, a range that's nearly two volts, which is quite epic. Um, and then, of course, this begs the question, all right, why? Why is this the case? So then off we go um, and do a little bit more testing. So a good place to start is usually using XPS to try and understand the alloy surface. So here we see uh, an XPS sur uh, survey spectrum and the high resolution uh, uh, O1S details that indicate significant complexity um, on this surface, which I'm going to try and unravel in the next slide. Now, trying to do this without a laser pointer um, <laughs> remotely is going to be a challenge. So there's a lot happening here, so I'll try and uh, spell it out for you. We carried out surface profiles, and on the bottom left we see the profiles for different etching terms, and we see the high resolution spectra for the constituent alloying elements. On the top right, we see the atomic concentrations with etch time, and on the bottom right, the relative fraction of phases with etch time. What is important to understand from this data is a few things. Firstly, the surface film does not have a composition that has the same stoichiometric proportions as the alloy. Secondly, and unambiguously, the surface film, so the oxide, has significant proportions of unoxidized metal within it. So metal in the metallic state embedded within the surface film, which is a unique finding. And also, as we etch into the specimen, it's also unusual that we're unable to get to a diminishing signal for oxygen, which means that the very low parts per billion traces of oxygen in the XPS chamber are reacting with the alloy, perhaps uh, pointing um, to the alloy's extreme reactivity with oxygen as opposed to its lack of reactivity being responsible for a high corrosion resistance. So there's a lot to take in uh, on this particular uh, uh, slide. In the context of unoxidized metal embedded in the surface film, how would this influence passivity or passive film stability, I should say? If we take the view of the point defect model developed by Digby McDonald, and consider the passive film as a combination of equations that represents reactions at the metal film interface and the film solution interface, the presence of unoxidized metal um, in a film of defects including cation and oxygen vacancies can have a rather profound influence in terms of stabilizing the film, providing both a barrier but also likely contributing to, re uh, contributing to relieving uh, things like local strain. Um, this is a very different picture to what classical thermodynamic stability is considered to be. Um, as we're presented with a film that is a non-stoichiometric cocktail, uh, inclusive of unoxidized metal, leaving us in sort of in a thermodynamic no-person's land. Now, this is quite difficult to explain from this picture, and I'm going to try and explain it a little bit better using alternative techniques. But before I move on, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Dr. Sebastian Thomas that actually helped draw this uh, this kind of epic um, point defect model type schematic of what we're, we're trying to say. But in order to try and get a better uh, understanding of dissolution and, and corrosion and passivity of this alloy, um, this is where our PhD uh, Sanjay Chudhari has come in to dig a bit deeper. So here what you'll see is the polarization curve for the uh, aluminium, titanium, chromium, vanadium alloy, which I'm focusing on for you know this chunk of the talk um, that you saw previously. But now it's been collected in the flow cell arrangement, um, which is employed for online ICP analysis. Um, Sanjay has defined three regions of passivity he calls primary, secondary, and tertiary tertiary regions of, of this sort of passive window, which are defined here by the transitions from uh, A to B, C to D, and E to F here. 
All right, so thank you uh, to Professor Kevin Ogle um, that I'll now mention again for giving the world the technique known as ASEC, Atomic Emission Spectroelectrochemistry, which uh, not only is online ICP, but it can be done during polarization. So what we see here is during the polarization scan previously shown is the dissolution of unique elements during polarization. Um, and it reveals quite starkly that the dissolution is incongruent. Chromium goes first and at pace, and then finally titanium goes last. And this is during the so-called upscan. So I know that if you've not seen these plots before, a lot to take in for the first time, but another way to visualize this is to look at the whole scan, including the reverse scan, which shows repassivation. So here we see the whole story whereby the red line is the potentiostat measured current, um, which you can see here the red line uh, on the plot, and the colored lines show the element by element dissolution, ionization, in other words, contributions to that total current. So what is determined is that by looking at the rate of dissolution element by element during the upscan, there is a beyond stoichiometric dissolution of chromium to a large extent. So chromium alone accounts for about 50% of the total dissolution current that we're seeing, then followed by vanadium. And whilst there is a slight enrichment of aluminium, so sub-stoichiometric dissolution, and a rather extreme enrichment of titanium on the surface. So as such, when the scan is reversed, uh, what, what the personality of the surface is, is very different to that when you first start your scan. And the personality of the surface when you reverse the scan following the solution is largely that of an enriched titanium surface, which very, and I mean extremely, very, very, very rapidly repassivates. So um, I'm sorry to sound a bit alarmist here, but now you can see from this sort of plot that there's not much to link the reality of the situation to the you know the your poor bay atlas and what we see uh, on the upside rather than being uh, scary is actually very very cool. Um, Sanjay conducted more XPS, which is why I skimmed over it before, and I'm going to abridge it quite quickly here to say that the primary film um, that persists at the open circuit potential is again highly enriched in unoxidized metal. Um, this has been confirmed. Uh, every which way, uh, you know, by angle resolved um, XPS on multiple high entropy alloys or CCAs on multiple instruments and by multiple users in multiple labs across the country. As the film develops through the passive window during polarization, as denoted by the so-called secondary and tertiary film namings, we see a decrease, but not to zero, in the unoxidized metal in the film, and we see a heterogeneous mixture of a surface film rich in titanium and aluminium and a, um, of an approximate thickness of around about uh, less than 10 nanometers. So a little bit of a summary here. Uh, lightweight CCAs may be readily produced by numerous methods. Um, the vast majority of, of CCAs and HEAs tested by us, and it's been hundreds to date, display spontaneous passivity in 0.6 molar sodium chloride. Um, and this persists regardless of heterogeneous microstructure. A unified understanding of passivity of these sorts of a new class of alloys requires further research focus. And I think the whole field is just getting started. Um, there's some fabulous works um, on this at the moment that you can find in the literature from 2020. So the whole year hasn't been lost. Um, and there's some great groups working on this at the moment across places like uh, Ohio State, Penn State, UVA, um, and numerous institutions across continental Europe too, and of course at the ANU. Um, some things are quite clear. The surface of such alloys is different and less typical to what's been studied for the last hundred years, and this is because CCAs and HEAs are indeed multi-principal element alloys. So there's multiple principal elements in the alloy, um, so there's no single dominant alloying element. The unoxidized metal in surface films is a characteristic, as is a highly heterogeneous mixture of oxides uh, in surface films. So passivity, as we know it, is perhaps dead. So before we finish, a little bit of reflection. Um, how does nature work? We take minerals that contain metallic atoms in some compound form, 
um, oxides, carbonates, um, and we put in a nation's worth of energy, at least that's the case for Australia, uh, and aluminium smelting in Australia, and we make stuff. And then the environment um, has its say, and nature takes it back. So wouldn't it be just better if we used rocks and minerals instead? Well, yes. So here's some examples of things that are a few thousand years old and are still there. Um, but I thought I'd leave you with this because it's what we're seeing at the surface of CCAs. We're seeing complex minerals that are effectively a salad bar of oxidation states and elements and stability um, that we may be onto something in terms of the way in which alloys are created so that the surfaces are engineered to turn into effectively rocks. So if so, can we design for such films that mimic nature? Um, and what this would, what would, you know, what would this look like? Something like this, perhaps. So I'm just trying to be a little bit funny here, but um, I'm not excluding surface coatings that are nowadays wonderful, but trying to focus on bulk material and its design. And in fact, this approach has been done, and we have done it before and shown it. Not in the case of CCAs, but for magnesium alloys. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but this is a magnesium lithium alloy that was designed to have a carbonate surface film. Now, you can't see lithium in EDS mapping, um, but given that magnesium is highly reactive, lithium even more so, designing an alloy that's going to be corrosion resistant onto very reactive uh, uh, metals is highly non-intuitive, but it works because of nature and what ends up on the surface film forming dynamically. Um, and that works because nature, nature works. So to tie it all up, when we think of emerging materials and corrosion, there are a few things to consider. Let's look at the top left, which is a depiction of a typical Aboriginal dwelling in some parts of Australia from about 30,000 years ago. This is a design that we actually can't celebrate today in the physical form because it was built to sustainably integrate back into nature and its carbon footprint was always zero. So uh, what is it that we actually need from our materials um, is a good question um, that we should all always be asking, as, particularly as materials engineers. Um, the bottom right shows an example of what is now a World Heritage Site, which is the site of the Brawarana fish traps. This is not only touted as the oldest man-made structure on Earth, but is actually the first example of an engineered structure. It's also the first uh, example of sustainable engineering. It's been made from local minerals, local rocks, and it's still present today, which shows you that rocks don't corrode very much, but also uh, illuminating um, a whole range of different aspects of ingenuity that can inform us as we move into the future. Um, for those that don't know where Brawarana is, it's, uh, it's denoted by that little red uh, pin on the map there. So, this is my last slide. What I want to say to everyone, and thanks for making it this far, is stay healthy, stay safe, and remember to be kind to yourself. The main point for today from me is that I want everyone to always remember that structural materials are anthropogenic. Us humans make them, so we own their deficiencies, and we should have some sense of responsibility for the solutions to these deficiencies. Now, finally, in a period of worldwide norms being shattered in the last few months, it's also a chance to reflect on values and to ponder, can we be as exceptional as the Aboriginal engineers were? Acknowledging that we now have very different expectations and standards of life, such as air travel, fast computers, iPhones, and so forth. But what I mean is on the basis of ingenuity and its balance with nature. So with that, Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak at this conference and uh, you can find me here and I would love to hear from uh, all of you at any time. Thanks.